Welcome back, everyone, to episode number five of Healthcare Trailblazers. Um, super excited today to have a very prestigious guest. We have uh, Dr. David Pate. Dr. David Pate, amongst different stops along his journey, but um, I think most, most notably was the CEO of St. Luke's Health System based in Utah, right? Idaho. Idaho. <laughs> Idaho. Close. Uh, yeah. Close. Um, and uh, I've known Dr. Pate for a number of months now. He very recently uh, retired as, form, as, as, as CEO and has been doing a bunch of advising and a lot of really cool gigs since then. Um, thank you so much for stopping by. My pleasure. Good to be with you. So we like to kind of go all the way back. Uh, you have had quite the career and I'm excited to go over some of the highlights, uh, but let's all, all the way back. What got you into medicine? Well, actually, I knew that I wanted to be a doctor when I was very, very young uh, because my brother became very ill and was hospitalized for a good part of a year off okay. and on. And so um, I, I think that's what really piqued my interest in going into medicine. How could I help my family? How could I keep them healthy? How could I prevent uh, people having to uh, get sick, go in the hospital? And so... It was a very early age. Wow. Now, was that because he had a negative experience or it just the process, you kind of got immersed in the process? Well, at that point, we lived in some barracks. Uh, my dad had been in the military um, and my brother was really my best friend. Uh, it was just him, him and myself. And okay. so I think it was really the, it wasn't that he had a negative experience. It was just that I was young. I didn't understand what was happening to him, but I knew that my best friend wasn't there for me to play with. And um, it, it was uh, obviously very traumatizing for him, but it was uh, traumatizing for me too, because I just didn't really understand uh, what was going on and when he was going to be back home and, and uh, able to play with me. <laughs> so you're talking really young. Young, <laughs> yeah, really yeah, young. yeah. Wow, wow. So right off the bat, you went to medical school. There was no, there was no different, very cool. Um, so what did you do after you graduated? So I uh, did my residency training in internal medicine, and then I had the uh, uh, distinction of being asked to be a chief medical resident in the Texas Medical Center, which I did. Cool. And then I entered into private medicine, uh, private medical practice of internal medicine in the Texas Medical Center. Uh, and um, I practiced uh, um, basically primary care, but for adults and and of course, being in the medical center, I tended to see uh, more complicated cases. Okay. Now, there's many initials after your name, and uh, <laughs> and you're also a lawyer, right? I am. So I when am. when did that happen, and how did that come about? So I was in I was in private practice, and uh, then when uh, President Clinton was elected, a big part of his administration, in fact, his first year of administration was for his wife, Hillary uh, Clinton, uh, to lead healthcare reform initiative. And at that point, I started getting very interested in how could I improve the system? How could I impact more people than just the one patient at a time that was sitting in my office? And um, it, from my vantage point, uh, being both a primary care physician in my practice, but also uh, working uh, in the hospital. Those days, we didn't have hospitalists and intensivists. So I saw my patients in the emergency room. I treated them on the floors. I treated them in the ICUs. And so I, I really had this very good look at all the pieces of our healthcare and how overwhelming it was for patients and how really inefficient it was and how it could be improved. And so I got very interested in healthcare reform at that time and wondering how could I make a difference? I decided to go to law school because I could do that at night and keep my practice. So um, uh, I, I went, went to law school, I focused on health law and uh, I had a outstanding office nurse who would take the calls uh, during the evenings when I was in class and determine which ones could wait till I got out of class, which ones did I need to be interrupted for. And, um, and so she assisted me in being able to get through uh, four years of law school going at night. 
Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Most doctors, uh, you know, that's the pinnacle of filling up your schedule, but nope. You, yeah. You went to yeah. law school at night. That's incredible. Yeah. And survived. Yeah. And, 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 and survived. I, I have to admit there were a few times I, I thought, what the heck am I doing? I probably should drop out. It's just, it's so much work. Um, but, um, but on the weekends I had two young uh, girls, I would take them to, uh, a playground or I would take them to, uh, one of these, uh, amusement things where I could sit there, drink coffee, read my legal books and the kids could play. <laughs> and, and so that was, uh, how we got through it. Wow. That's, that's really incredible. <laughs> and something out there to a lot of people that say, you know, they're too busy, um, to get one career. <laughs> you're out there doing well <laughs> I, I think the other thing is that my wife was incredibly supportive and uh, I, I certainly couldn't have done it without her because she had to uh, pick up a lot of the slack obviously yeah well that's yep super important shout out to uh, all the wonderful uh, partners and um, that support so okay so you so, so you so you become a lawyer now you're a doctor and a lawyer so how did your um, how did being a lawyer impact your practicing and furthering your interests and ambitions and really affecting a change in healthcare at large? Yeah, it was actually, uh, it turned out to be extremely helpful. Uh, I, I really didn't appreciate, appreciate at the time how much help it was going to be to my career. Uh, but before I graduated law school, I uh, had offers to join a couple of different organizations to serve as a medical director. Uh, and uh, one was a national company, uh, which was very, very tempting. Uh, another was uh, the hospital that I actually served as chief resident at in the Texas Medical Center. And so it was a, a very painful discussion uh, and decision uh, to try to have to decide, do I stay in my practice? Do I take one of these opportunities? Because I did want to do something more. And ultimately, I decided I would join uh, that hospital in the Texas Medical Center that I was the chief medical resident at. So um, I uh, joined them as the medical director. My first job was to put together our primary care network okay. uh, so that uh, we could begin, uh, you know, building that base uh, in order to prepare ourselves to really manage care, manage costs, coordinate care, those kinds of things. So that was my, my first entree. Wow. Okay. And how long, how long were you there? And, and you went straight to medical, the rest you went from chief, chief resident to medical director. <laughs> well, I went to, from chief resident to practice. Uh, well, you had your own then, practice in the intro. Then to, okay. then to medical director. And then, you know, after that, I had some successive uh, promotions. I uh, uh, eventually became chief medical officer for the entire health system. And then I actually became CEO of that uh, hospital where I was a medical student and then a resident and then a chief resident and um, had no idea but that that would ever happen or never crossed my mind but I became CEO of that that hospital wow what a story they put you're probably the poster yeah. uh, the poster boy for them you know <laughs> away from a to a CEO that's incredible so how long how many years did you stick around there what was that so so I was, um, I was, you know, by the time I was CEO, I was there for about three and a half years when a recruiter contacted me uh, who indicated that um, he was looking for the president and CEO of St. Luke's Health System uh, here in Idaho. <clears throat> and um, I had really never contemplated uh, coming to Idaho. Uh, frankly, uh, all my family was in Houston. Uh, that's, I'd been there for 33 years. Uh, but he, you know, I trusted him and I, I said, okay, well, look, I'll just go up there and see. I've never been to Idaho. Uh, actually I fell in love with Boise, uh, overnight. Okay. It, it was, uh, uh, amazing uh, weather. I didn't mind uh, getting away from the humidity uh, of Houston. It's right. uh, uh, beautiful up here. Um, and uh, what was most appealing to me is that ever since that time when I spoke about with uh, President Clinton coming into office and my desire to have some kind of role in healthcare transformation, healthcare reform, when I looked at the situation in Idaho with St. Luke's health system, I realized 
this is the place I could actually do it. I could hmm. actually change healthcare. I could actually make a difference. And, and we're so poised uh, here to be able to do that. And that was what the real exciting opportunity was. And so eventually I, I, did ex I was offered and I accepted the position. I came here and I was uh, C CEO of the health system for about 10 and a half years. Wow. What about the system told you that this was a great canvas for you to, 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 to paint your beautiful picture of change on? So, you know, one of the fundamental problems with managed care or taking risk for uh, uh, patients is that if you're really going to coordinate that care and take financial risk for it, you don't want what a lot of people would refer to as leakage. You don't want people, you know, moving in and outside of your network, your, your uh, delivery system, because then you lose control of the costs. And so here in Idaho, uh, what the, the situation was is there really was two health systems here uh, in this part of the state. And people tended to have a great deal of loyalty to one or the other. Hmm. And so uh, lots of patients at St. Luke's that were born at St. Luke's uh, then grew up, delivered their babies at St. Luke's, and then those kids grew up and stayed. And so um, what I saw was this great ability to have this longitudinal care of, of them. And, you know, of course, one of the reasons why uh, it, it transitions to value have been so hard for payers is that people switch payers all the time. And, you know, you should change employment, you get a new insurance company, whatever. Uh, somebody changes the rate. And of course, we know people will change healthcare plans for a premium difference of $5 a month. Yeah. And so what was important to me is um, they could they could move payers, but if, if they were staying with St. Luke's, we had the opportunity, we could take the risk, we could make investments in their health that if you're the payer, you're not gonna make a lot of investments because they may not be with you more than one, two, three, four years. And it takes a long time for those, those investments to pay off, but we could make them and they would actually pay off for us. And so I thought, this is the way to do it. And Incredible. It was Incredible. exciting. Wow, yeah. so you started mentioning a little bit, so I wanna <laughs> jump back out and uh, kind of give two of the highlights, I think, of your 10 plus years at St. Luke's. And uh, you grew the revenue to $3 billion um, yeah. through your time there, which is an incredible, incredible achievement. And then in addition to that, not only did you grow the revenue to $3 billion, but you tr transformed a third, right? A third of that revenue yes. into yeah. uh, risk and value-based care kind of payments, which I think a lot of people see as two conflicting things. And if oh, you're yeah. taking risk and you're probably losing money um, and you've managed to not only um, take on a whole bunch of risk, not only did you not lose money, but you did that while growing those revenues. So I think I, I know you have a lot of little secret sauces as far as um, what went in to make that great match and make sure that both of those things uh, work together and not uh, and not against each other. So let's get into it. Value based care. Super important to you. Uh, clearly, it goes all the way back to the Clinton administration when you want it went to become a lawyer so you can affect change. Um, so the, yeah, talk to us about the journey at St. Luke's and transforming it into a system that's proud to say that over a third of their revenue is in value-based care. Yeah, so, uh, so you're right. Let me just describe a minute uh, that endpoint and then I'll go back and, and tell the story. But so of that 3 billion in revenue, what we're talking about is a billion was in full risk, meaning global capitation. In other words, uh, for any of your listeners that don't know what that is, that means we took a fixed payment uh, every month and then we were responsible for all the care that was necessary for that patient, no matter where they got the care. Uh, and so um, that was where we got to. Now, going back to the beginning, of course, you don't do this overnight. Uh, so what we did is when I got there, the first thing is um, that I actually had to spend the first couple of years just making sure that my executive team and the board understood what we were going to do and agreed with it. Because obviously, if you're going to change your business model, you're taking a huge risk. Many industries 
have failed because the business model changed on them uh, and they didn't evolve. In this case, I was talking about us purposely changing the business model so we would have a little bit more control of it. But obviously, you don't want to do that unless your team is aligned with you and your board is aligned with you because it's not going to be smooth sailing. There's going to be lots of bumps in, in the road and you want to make sure that everybody is aligned. So we did that. The big thing that was extremely helpful about that is when I uh, became CEO of St. Luke's Health System, it was six months before the Affordable Care Act passed. So I, I mentioned before about the Clinton administration efforts, but now we're in the Obama years and the first year and the Affordable Care Act. And so this is a national discussion about health care reform. And at that point, of course, we couldn't have known whether it was going to end up passing or not. It was very contentious. But it's the platform that I use to talk to my team and the board that the very fact that the president, Congress, feels the need to change our health care delivery system that's a warning sign that they see our healthcare delivery system is broken. They need to take action. And so did we want to let Washington impose change on us or did we want to take control and drive our future? And that was basically what we decided. Flash forward six months later, the Affordable Care Act would pass. And you were uh, ready. But we were ready and we were getting ready. And so what we started doing is figuring out, okay, we've lived in fee for service where we get paid for everything we do, regardless of whether it's necessary, regardless of whether there's a good outcome, um, it, whether the, regardless of whether there's an alternative that's less expensive, you just get paid. And so that was the business model. Now we're talking about going to a system where we're going to take on all the financial risk, where, where whatever we do, now, instead of the services being provided are now a source of revenue, fee for service, now everything we do is a cost and it comes, it gets deducted from our monthly uh, fixed payment for these folks. So what we did is uh, we looked at um, all aspects of this. So the first thing is you obviously don't want to compensate your executive team based on fee for service metrics, you know, the, the growth in volumes, uh, the increase in reven revenues, you've got to change it so that your executive team is not going to be financially penalized for trying to keep people out of hospitals and try to, to uh, make sure people stay healthy and don't need your services. So you need to make sure there are no competing uh, uh, incentives. And so basically um, it was easy at our health system because we didn't have a bonus system. We were one of the very few health systems that didn't. And the board was very wise. And we determined the key thing is no bonuses. You know, the, you get, you get paid what you get and the, your, your reward for doing a good job is you get to continue to be employed. Uh, wow. And so, so that was the first thing. The second and, thing and was- that, Sorry, that didn't hinder your ability to attract top tier talent? We worried it would, it didn't. It didn't at all. Wow. Because what was, what, what was happening, Mendel, is that when people were hearing about what we want to do, they aligned with that vision. And they were, they were like, this is exciting. I want to be part of this. <laughs> and so we actually had, we, I cannot think of one- case. A lot of people ask questions about it because they were used to bonus systems in their previous jobs. So they would ask questions, but I don't re recall one person turning down an offer for us because we didn't have a bonus system. Wow. Uh, and uh, so that was the first thing. The second thing was, if, if we're going to do this, we have got to drive our quality to the highest possible levels because better quality is lower cost. If you don't perform surgery well, what do you get? You get complications. And under fee for service, you have that complication. You just get paid more because you build that fee. <laughs> but in a value system, any of those complications, we're paying for. Yeah. And so we began to look at our processes across the health system and make sure that we moved everyone to best practices and that we, we looked at every step of what we do to see, is it necessary? Is it adding value? And is it potentially going to harm a patient? And so one of the things that we did, for example, is we had 
we had, if you compared us to other hospitals, we had very, um, very reasonable um, infection rates after uh, joint replacement surgery. Um, and, and we fell in the middle of the pack, it was fine. What we did is we said, can we get it to zero? Can we, because what we, what we calculated is that one joint infection, one post-op joint infection would cost us $147,000 wow. uh, to treat it. So what we did is we said, you know, healthcare hadn't figured out how to get to zero infections. So we went out of our industry and it happens that a company here in Boise is, uh, that's an international company, is called Micron and they make computer chips. And if you're making a computer chip, if one little particle gets into them when they're being made, it destroys them. So they have a system so that they can produce these flawlessly. And so we engaged their help to look at um, how we could reduce our infections because there's two big ways that a joint gets infected when you do the surgery. The first is that it got introduced from the skin because you didn't clean the surface area. And of course, everybody does a very thorough cleaning these days, but that's one way. But the other way is it's particulate matter that falls into the open wound in the air. And what we did when we studied this with Micron and, and we also went to Boise State University and got an air engineer to help us. And what we could do is we had been focusing on lean. Lean is a, a, a methodology to eliminate waste. And what we realized is that it was actually hurting us in terms of our operating room procedures. Because when you try to have only what you just need in the operating room, there's going to be a lot of times where somebody has to go out of that room to go get another supply that you need and bring it back in the room. And what we determined is every time that door opens, you could measure the particle counts. They just skyrocketed wow. uh, because it stirred up the air and all. And so what we did is we changed it so that we didn't have extra people coming into the room. We minimized the activity of people going in and out and we cut our uh, infection rate in more than half. And it was already good to begin. And wow. so we, that was one example. That's so original though. I, I, I love yep. the fact that that, that a, a company that makes computer chips was, was the, like, who thought of that? That's amazing. Well, <laughs> and I think that's that. the, and that's one of the problems with healthcare is we tend to think that, you know, no, it, there's nothing else like healthcare. No other companies can help us. And of course that's not right. In fact, lean comes from Toyota. Uh, and wow. so I had years ago visited a Toyota plant to learn about lean and apply that at the hospital. And now this, and I think there are many lessons that we can learn from outside healthcare to apply. So we just started doing a whole series of those things, looking across the board, how could we improve care? Uh, you know, back when I trained as a doctor, uh, if you were in the ICU, God forbid, and we had you on a ventilator, we were very careful not to move you because we didn't want to dislodge the tube. Well, what we've come to find is that actually prolongs your recovery and increases the chances for complications. So hmm. what we started doing is we actually get you up, even though you're connected to a breathing machine, and we start walking you. And what we found out is that, which was something that would have never crossed my mind. But when we started doing that, we were able to help people maintain strength, decrease pneumonia rates, decrease skin breakdown rates, decrease urinary tract infection rates. And what we did is we got people out of the ICUs uh, uh, quicker, off ventilators quicker, and with fewer complications. And again, value-based, we're paying for those complications. So that was another example. Another, another example is we have a lot of rural hospitals uh, in our health system and all, almost all of the intensivists that are in our state are in metropolitan areas. And in this part of the state, they're in Boise. And so we did EICU across our health system so that we could manage any of those critically ill patients at another hospital with the expertise of an in intensivist. And, and then here's what it did. Number one is 
uh, it's been clear that when an intensivist manages your care, the costs are less, the complications are less. But the other thing is, if you are in critical care, say at my, uh, you need critical care and you're at my Sun Valley Hospital. And it, so in order to move you to the Boise ICU, going to be thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 because we've got to airlift you wow. uh, to get you here. Well, with EICU, we don't have to move you because we can keep you there. And so I've already saved thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for every one of those cases. So it's all these things where not only are you saving costs, but you're improving the care at every step of the way. And so what happened is uh, within about four to five years, um, understand St. Luke's health system was not even the quality leader in our market at the time that I arrived. Within four to five years, we were ranked as one of the top performing hospital health systems in the whole country wow. <clears throat> for quality and safety. And we've maintained that now for nine years. That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. And, and just to give some of our listeners that may not be as familiar a bit of perspective, the difference between fee-for-service and value-based care, like you kind of touched on, it's not, it's not just a different model. It's a completely opposite model. Everything, really in fee-for-service, everything in fee-for-service that you want because it makes you money becomes a liability in value-based care, like you were kind of talking about. So I think there's two things that are really incredible and that people need to appreciate here. And that is number one, being able to uh, develop so, so much of, of your business into value-based care. But the second thing is to do that with, you didn't do it from the ground up, which is easier in a sense. You did it from the yeah. confines of a fee-for-service structure and staff. Right. And like you were talking about, even just basic compensation um, you know, calculations, everything, the whole thought process is so, so different. And it's, 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 an, incredible, um, it's an incredible thing. Um, Let's, let's talk about vision for a second, because clearly you went in with the, you, you know, you, you, you didn't just take on the job and this kind of happened. You clearly right. went in with a vision. This is what I want to do. It took you 10 years to do it. And you came out the end, you know, obviously looking awesome. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I find the ability to have that 10 year vision really fascinating. Can you talk about what you've used throughout your, your career to be, to, envision something so far out and to take it piece by piece. Even when you talk about it, it took me three, four years to convince the board. Three, four years is a time span that some people can't even yep. think that far ahead. So to think yeah. that I'm, I'm going to be at step three of my 10-year plan, I think is a fascinating thing. So if you could talk about that for a bit. Yeah. Well, Mendel, that's probably the most important question you've asked me. And that is that I do think vision is the key to success. If you have a great vision, it doesn't mean you're going to be successful. But if you don't have a good vision, it's highly unlikely you're going to be successful. And so, you know, I think for us and, and of course, across the country, if you talk with CEOs of health systems across the country, it, it, it is going to be almost every one of them that will tell you, yes, healthcare is going to move towards value. Uh, it is moving towards value and it will continue to. Almost everybody will. <clears throat> so what I say is uh, to people that ask me about this is, look, you need to start with a world vision, a real a world view. What is your view of the world? In other words, do you believe that fee for service is working? Do you believe that the American healthcare system can sustain fee for service? Do you believe that employers will continue to pay annual increases in uh, fee-for-service rates? Do you believe that payers will? Do you believe the government will? And, you know, it's interesting because when you ask those questions, most people will tell you, no, that's not going to work. If you really believe that, if that is your worldview, then you want to do something to change it, <laughs> change your <laughs> positioning for that. And it's amazing that very few health systems have made much of a change. When you ask um, people around the country, oftentimes they'll tell you, you know, three, four percent of their business is, is at risk. And again, I'm talking about what we did at St. Luke's, where it's a third uh, of our business. Um, and, um, and the problem is, if you dabble, like three to four percent, you're not going to pay. That's not the book of business you're going to pay you pay attention to because guess what, the 97 or 96 percent is fee for service. That's what you're going to focus on, and that's why those health systems aren't making much progress. With us, 
uh, I said, if this is our worldview, and it was, everybody agreed fee-for-service could not uh, be sustainable long-term, then it's better for us to make the changes because when you do change business models, you often have a period of a few years where you lose money doing that. And so I think the next question after is, what is your worldview is, if you agree that that's the view, then do you want to make the change now while you're still doing well in fee for service and it can subsidize your losses? Or do you want to wait until the government payers and employers drive your fee for service rates down to where you're breaking even or losing money and now try to change your business model and lose money on top of that. And our board decided, no, we'd rather make that change now. And it took us about three to four years to get to profitability with the change. So I was glad we did it now and, and position. And now we know how to do this. Yeah. And so it's been easy to uh, continue to add on to that business. In fact, uh, since I've been retired in the last two years, uh, I understand now the health system is up closer to about 45 percent uh, uh, global cap arrangements where we're at full risk. So that's easy to do. And in fact, you'll want to do it. And, and it's because of the point you made, Mendel, that the fee for service and pay for value are completely at, at conflict. And it, especially if you're taking full risk. And so what you want to do, and I think another key success factor for us, because we learned from other industries that went through this, and we've learned for some from the few health systems that had already tried to do this and failed. And that is you've got to separate the business. Because yep. if you have people living in both of those worlds and they're schizophrenic, at the end of the day, they figure out which one is more important to the bottom line and to my pay and so forth. So what, what we did is I set up a completely separate company that huh. um, was and put a leader in there from the insurance industry, uh, put a whole team in there. And their job was to focus on value based care, full risk care, 24 hours a day. They were not to consider fee for service. They were not to be intimidated by any of the folks on our health system side that were upset about what was happening to fee for service. You just drive the volume based care, the, the, the value based care, the, the risk, all of the changes we need to make, investing in the analytics, investing in the care management, investing in utilization management, all those things that we need to do, you do that and you do it without any encumbrance from the fee for service part. That's another key part of it. That's brilliant. So how did you go about converting segments of the business into value-based care or did nothing ever convert completely? How did that work? So at the end of the day, even if they're focused on it 24 seven, there's gotta be pieces of, the, of, of your care that's moving yeah. over. So how did you juggle that? Well, and, and what we did is of course, the first thing is uh, I talked incessantly uh, at every meeting, at every time I went around the health system, explaining our vision, explaining where we were going, explaining why we were doing that, and engaging people. And so even people outside of this company that's solely focused on it, it's actually a very inspiring business. Uh, you know, it's hard to get people inspired about saying, you know, we need to crank up our number of uh, hip replacements. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's not terribly inspiring. But when you talk to them about what this means, how we can benefit the communities we serve, how we can keep healthcare costs down, how we can actually help guarantee for an employer that your healthcare costs will not go up next year. Uh, we will take that risk, not you. And you begin getting this situation where your employees are excited, your doctors are excited, and even the community's getting excited because this is really good news for them. And so what we did is we continued to get all of our ducks in a row, and we did some early experimentation by first joining Medicare Shared Savings Program and getting to learn some lessons there, get familiar with interpreting the data uh, and, and using data to drive some of our process improvements, 
to do to then going into uh, the the actual um, advanced ACO programs, and then um, we said, okay, we're ready. And then on uh, January 1st of 2017, so seven years in, we said that's our date. And every payer agreement that we could, every employer agreement we could, we shifted them all to uh, to Global Cap because. What we said, and I think this is another mistake, as I mentioned, a lot of health systems saying they've got three or four percent of their business in risk. You're not going to learn. You're not going to. Uh, that's not what you're going to focus on. What we said is we have to jump into the deep end. Otherwise, and lose at first. Yeah, it's not going to get your attention. It's not going to get your focus. And and so if we're serious about it, let's jump. And so really. On that day, that was about when about a third of our business moved to full risk. The other benefit was, I mentioned the two health systems, the other health system wanted nothing to do with risk. And so one of the questions we asked ourselves, is there a first to market mover advantage? And we thought there would be, and it turned out we were right. Because once we had this offering and our competitor did not, all those payers and all those employers that wanted this, we were their They're own choice. Yeah. And so they came to us and that's how we were able to shift a, a whole bunch of that business over. Wow. So since your time there, you've been doing consulting. Uh, you do, I, I know you publish a very popular blog. Uh, you, do, you do consulting on COVID um, and also pushing other systems and uh, CEOs to move in the, in the value direction, right? Yeah. So what are, what are some of the things that you'll tell someone that's reluctant or possibly, you know, just you're, you're clearly a very inspired person yourself and that's why you're able to inspire a lot of people. You have this vision, um, you've executed on it, you've had success with it, but for someone that possibly isn't there mentally or, you know, for whatever reason, what do you tell your, your colleagues uh, to try to nudge them in that direction? I, I think the, the most powerful thing, Men, Mendel, is a lot of times, it is difficult to move a CEO to a different position based on um, just inspiration because okay. CEOs have to be a bit risk adverse. Uh, they like to keep their jobs. Uh, <laughs> they usually, uh, part of keeping their jobs depends on their performance. So yeah, it, you know, it's nice to be inspired, but if it means that we're going to lose a lot of money, forget it. Um, and so I don't think that's the most powerful way to move them. I think the really the most powerful way to do it is to make sure that they don't look at, well, moving to risk is risky. Well, yeah, that's true, but they don't consider the other side of the equation. And that's the point that I make not moving to risk is risky. And so that's when I show them, it, you know, the first thing I can do is just ask them, look, just get your CFO to plot out your last five years. Now it's gonna be, you gotta take out all the extra COVID funding and stuff. So these last couple of years are in embarrassing, but maybe even just go to the five years prior to 2020 then. Look at your payments. Um, your payment, your reimbursement history for Medicare, Medicaid, your largest commercial payers, um, and so forth, and see what's happening to that. And are your uh, increases in fee-for-service rates becoming less? They almost always are. Or in some case, like the government, they're staying flat or decreasing. And so it, once they realize that, then I say, now look at your costs and it, tell me what's happening to your costs. Supply chain costs are up. Um, uh, you know, we're having to pay uh, employees more, your cost of benefits, all that. Look at what's the rate of increase of your cost. And now just do a little projection and figure out unless you come up with, and of course we've all done all these, you know, cost cutting initiatives and all. And, and sure, a health system can cut a bunch of costs over a couple of years. And then you look out the next five years or so and they kind of come back. So just look at and see what does that portray for you financially? And what is the risk of that? That is very risky in my view. 
And so now, if you now can, if, if you now have them in a position where they realize the status quo is risky and going to value is risky, but then you ask them about this worldview, where are things going? Well, they're going to risk. Uh, and you ask them about, and if you think it's going there, do you think there would be a first to market mover advantage? And of course I can share what's happened in our, and, and by the time you start adding everything up, it's like, it's almost a slam dunk. Oh my God. Yeah. We need to change to risk and we need to do it now. Right. And then it's a question of, they just don't know how. And, and because all of them have spent their careers in fee for service, but so you have to, you know, help them with a roadmap that like what we've talked about, how you do that. And, and it is hard work yeah. and it means changing the investments you're making. It, it, it means changing your philosophy, your outlook. It means looking top to bottom, like we talked about uh, from incentive pay to how you are actually, what things you're making investments in and uh, you know, no longer, is this uh, a, an arms race with your competitor about, can you market that? Hey, we've got this brand new machine that can do something. You should come to us. That's not going to get you where you need to go. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating thing of the human condition that we're, we're, we're more prone to deal with something that's familiar to us, even though it's terrible, yep. rather than move to something that's, that's less familiar. So I, I, your message is, I guess, you know, take your head out of the sand, look around yep. you and yep. uh, start taking some actions, including joining an ACO, some of the things you mentioned, uh, take some baby steps, um, but really put some focus on moving to value-based care. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're just about up on our time. It's really good to see you again. Always uh, a very, it's a breath of fresh air always talking to you. So I appreciate you making <laughs> time and uh, best of luck with, with everything. Hope to talk to you again soon. Well, thank you, Mendel. Thanks for having me and uh, great to talk about all this with you.